And there are two things that should be mentioned before we start. This session is different. It's not intended to be lecture and probably something close to seminar. But the intention is fundamentally different. It's not really just to receive things and listen to something which maybe might be interesting and provocative and go home. It's introduction to a different sequence from the whole standard of lectures and seminars as we know it. And because what we would like to do is meet regularly, say every second month or something there, with more kind of contribution of people who are doing something similar. And the similar is to come up with very concrete vision of what the European city, and I'm going to talk about European cities with obviously certain kind of links and annotations to the rest of the world. But before we can talk about Brazil, China, India, and so on, which I'm not going to do unless very angry may come to it for secondary reasons, other primary reasons, uh, it's going to be European city. Because, you, you know, it's very silly when you meet so many people around nowadays they're doing brilliant housing in Hong Kong or in Singapore and so on. And never be too part of that. Or doesn't know much what Italy is going to do. What's happening there in the 20s and 30s and what you know, Mussolini dreams was about. So suddenly you don't realize you are in Singapore and you're doing Mussolini without knowing it. Mm. So you go, so you go. Anyway, so European city. And it's very difficult, but that's what makes it so provocative in nice, I would say. I like it. Because it's a territory that we need for the immediate coming years. You know, what we would like to do on a very which is as far as possible balanced, very carefully balanced and tough relationship between being idealistic as far as we can make it, visionary, but realistic. The best stage would be exploring possible realities, of which they are, of course, almost infinite. Comes a point where if you are smart enough, intelligent, know where to stop. And you start sort of looking at the second half of the problem, which is real possibilities. So from possible realities to real possibilities. And bringing those two together, I think, is the key. The rest, of course, is another story, you know, how you can handle it, how much skills you have, and so on and so forth. But, you know, that's normal that's in every project. So that's number one. And number two is, of course, um, the arrangement and contribution. I would expect that the next session can be introduced by anybody, or me, even two or three people, doesn't matter, short and uh, presentation of a vision of a possibility. And you know, the possibility would be to some extent predefined or pre um, predefined, pre anticipated rather, anticipated, so we can respond to it. Because quite frankly, we may end up if you link sorry, if you think about it yourself and you take the current scene in consideration as a whole, you probably discover quite soon that there are four or five maybe, probably not necessarily more, in the beginning. Territories, areas, clusters of questions, issues, that can be, you know, dealt with. And I end up myself today, for instance, just to give an example at the very end, going to be the question, you know, how you deal with the problem of urbanity and sub-urbanity? And it's interesting, the problem is in between, isn't it? And yet, you find an infinite amount of material about restoring the public life, restoring urbanity in cities and all this. And then, of course, cultivation of the dream, how to make it into something possible on the level of suburbanity. So the current government is dreaming about silly things like introducing as a key, as a paradigm on the future scene, garden cities. Good luck. We look at uh, two contrasting examples, and we'll be starting with a dialogue. Yeah. Oh. Two pieces from the same spectrum. What we design and how we design. 
but, but again, in the very first sentence almost, I would say, the notion of architecture and city is still completely confused in terms of believing. Most people, even very intelligent one, believe that architecture has something to do with the city. Well, I would say yes, but only something. And if you pretend, you know, if you believe that once you do architecture pieces and you are okay at that field, you can do any kind of urban introduction or in, in intervention, you are definitely, definitely on the wrong track. And it comes back probably to Renaissance. The Renaissance already begin to get it wrong. They believe that if you can do one piece, you can do a large piece. And city is a large building. Well, is it? If you believe that, you can believe anything. So they believe that, you see, and they follow that line. So of course, what happens is that you don't have a sense on which you can possibly be responsible for any kind of scale you're dealing with. So you're doing infill buildings somewhere in a very tough surroundings, fine. But then you're doing a piece for 35,000 people somewhere on a open green land. And you don't see there's a problem, there's a kind of difference. All right, so that's really kind of opening the question. Because cities, of course, not only is it different in scale, different in complexity, etc., etc., but it's also different in terms of the level of reality on which it takes place and how it is coming to existence. City has not the same source, only to a limited extent, but that wouldn't take you very far. So, city in that case has to be taken really from a different angle and then on a different level. The level actually is not that terribly difficult for us to understand. I'm sure that most of you, doesn't matter you know, what kind of schools you come from, the little at least that I remember hearing in every school almost, that architecture has something to do also with culture. So architecture is a culture enterprise. It's fine. We all agree. And you say that architecture is something tangible. That's fine. But where is culture? Culture is not tangible. Very sculpture. Well, you have to go there in order to make it visible. I mean, culture is such for us as architects. It's not really the institutions, the universities, the seminars, the bookshops, the uh, theaters, etc., etc., the other music, literary, you know, literary life, and so on. That's part of it, but it's always somewhere. And that's the somewhere brings it to architecture, because theaters have to have a building or so on. What's that all? You can go on and on and on. So the culture, is somewhere, and it belongs to a particular level of public. And that's where it begins to be an actual problem. We may go into broader spheres, we may look at paintings and sculptures and literature and music, and so that's fine. But the point of departure, the point of reference, is on the ground, when you put your foot just on the ground, and where you are, that you are part of the public body, maybe, you call it, of the city. It's interesting that, you know, just as a kind of footnote, some intelligent art historians and architectural historians talk about uh, their discipline, their own discipline, as a problem of the city. There is a man called Giulio Carlo Arnaman, very intelligent, one of the more intelligent Italian art historians, who says, who write a book, for instance, that's called The History of Art as a History of the City. And it's only then that you begin it too kind of country times with what is really involved. Because once you ask a question, you get the right answer, beginning to get the right answers. So, you know, art is nowhere, everywhere, it's in the museums and so on. But that's exactly the other side of the story that we are in. We as architects sitting here, the poor art historians and artists on the other side of the spectrum, you know, they don't have the building, and we just have nothing but the building. So, you know, and in between, Hicks and Leones, you know, building is. So um, I'm just mentioning it by then. So the so-called cultural dimension of architecture, architecture seen as cultural phenomenon or discipline, asks if you're serious and you know what you're talking about, not just showing off. You have to go and tell me what it is. Where is it? And what is it? Well, that exactly something called back to illustrate. And it's the beginning of that illustration. We'll continue on the, on the line, I suppose. You probably know where we are now, in my very favorite part of Paris, Saint-Michel, 
bulha, bulmish, as they call it, locals. And you look at it, and what you think? It looks like they essentially, suppose that you know nothing about history. First time in Paris, and you just look at that stuff. What time is it? Has it been built all in one go? By one developer, one company? A small group of architects or individual architects? None of that. None of that. Dozens of architects. And three quarters of them we don't know by name and never were because they're just anonymous. Some of them were kind of architects who were basically working in builders' offices. So they did job in working drawings and so on. It was very school. And they didn't do architecture in proper sense or in physics. So it's a mixture, it's a combination of all these skills. The boulevard wasn't there before 1850. We are about 1852. They begin to contemplate how to cut through. And we are now moving into a territory where, as you look at it now, open mind and open eye, you can see quite clearly that what you're doing is, is layered valve. The valve which obviously comes out as series of sequence of buildings. But the buildings are almost like a transparent wall into a valve. And the valve has a commercial level, very rich, on the ground floor, which goes from bookshops to agencies and you know, facilities and so on and so forth. Now, <coughs> in what happens inside, you are even more kind of uncertain because inside the buildings are people like, you know, the ground floor will be commercial, the first floor sometimes belongs to it. You know, cafe will be very often in place on the first floor as well. And so it was. Or maybe offices as well. And then it goes into much more private realm, much more introverted rather than internal world, which has to do with people like lawyers and doctors and dentists and you, you name it. And the residential and the top floor would be people who are students, artists, and people who are usually sort of cheap, cheap, cheap pieces of music. It would amuse you because. I myself didn't know that until I came to you know, live for a bit in Paris. From about 1860-something, even under Oswald, actually, end of Oswald period, until first of all, in the bylaw, in the regulation, the building regulation of Paris was at the top floor in a certain part of Paris, the internal city around this moment, where had to be, had to have a studio. The top floor would not get planning permission if it was not a studio. Good. Well, it didn't last forever, but that doesn't matter. That they ever did it, that any country, any place could afford to do it without a revolution. Good enough. So that gives you an idea. So that we kind of, you know, stratified now that goes vertically, stratified now that goes horizontally. And you sit down and look at it all, you live in it for a few days or weeks, or whatever, and then ask a very simple question What a wonderful little place. Who made it? Who made it? Who made it who are Michel? No answer. Right is so. Because all these things are part of the contribution to it. Now, that's easy to say. The truth is that what comes out of the complexity is not chaos or mess. It's pretty well organized life. If you have any doubts, you know, you stay in one of those flats. And you know, in two days, what is conciergerie? Con conciergerie. She can give you help. She knows exactly who you are with, where, how much you spend on taxis. And so it goes, so it goes. So it's organized, but not offensive. You take it for granted, it's part of life. You have your relationship with your butcher, with your patisserie, with your whatever, you know, they bring things in well before waitrose, they've been delivering things to houses and so forth and so on. Just to give you a very amusing, and I'm not going to continue because it's, you know, the complexity is too much. In still almost to the end of the century, 19th century, they didn't have bathrooms in the houses, French. <laughs> and <coughs> they didn't need it, a lot of colony. Um, but they have special industry. The bathroom was mobile. There was a small group, usually young people, who were carrying out the 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 the, 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 the bus tube, probably made out of zinc, so it was light, 
and two little boys carrying cans with very hot water. Sometimes high up to seven four floor. They produced the bathroom when it was over, paid a bit, next time. So let you say you know the metabolism and you know the kind of spontaneous almost way of coming to terms with better preconditions and way of life. Obviously it starts changing, you know, when it comes to the turn of the century. The Belle Epoque in Paris particularly is a radical change. A lot of things happening. Lifts are beginning to be introduced first. Because you can imagine most of the houses, ninety percent of them, until eight hundred and late nineteenth century didn't have didn't have lift or pedestrian walking up the staircase and so on. So basically there's a three dimensional richness. And if you go through that, you take a segment of the street and draw three dimensional kind of uh, visionary drawing of it. Where things are, what they're doing, how they do. What is amazing about it, what is really amazing about it is that despite all this kind of apparent improvisation, spontaneity, blah, 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 you discover order after order after order of different kinds again and again. It has order, it's ordered. And it's just like, you know, the condition that you get in some of the territories in this country, that con you know, the constitutions for many places and institutions, but they're not written down. You know, when we came to Cambridge, I said, what I'm supposed to do, you know, what kind of lecture, what kind of this, what kind of that, when I'm supposed to exam, don't go there, don't worry, just keep going, you will learn as you go. So we do, we did. And it's probably one of the best, because it's a kind of concrete thing that cannot be substituted by anything written down. Simple as that, very much. Now what I'm intrigued by that, and I'll bring it now more into light, what I'm intrigued by is this open-endedness, the relative spontaneity, the concreteness of it, the openness to time, and yet very structured. And it's amusing rather to hear, you know, people making comments about the French that are just too, too, regimented and organized and so on, which is true. But they're organized in a way that they don't necessarily lose the second half of the reality, which is the spontaneous, creative, imaginative, visionary, and so on and so forth. And that particular balance, of course, is what particularly in France has reached a point of sophistication that probably would be very difficult to measure in European history. Is anything until you come back to maybe Greece? So the quality of philosophy and quality of painting and sculpture and architecture can be put to the same level. And it's highly sophisticated, highly structured, there's a profound deep order, an ordering process, you know, single Platonism and Pythagoreanism and so on and so forth. That's what the French is. I'm not saying that the rest of Europe does not, but if there is a measure, high horizon is there for that, it will be to start in France. I'm not paid for it, I'm not Franco Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> to be objective. But comes other places, of course. You know, the Austrians study in Italy. So this is already, to be absolutely frank, one of the reasons I'm choosing Paris as a point of departure, because once you know Paris, you would not have difficulty with Brussels. <laughs> no. I haven't said anything <laughs> provocative yet. <laughs> so, um, you know, the rest of Europe somehow is very much focused on a series of centers. That's very interesting. You know, that if you take Europe right away through the 300, 400 years, 16th to 19th, 20th century, you certainly would have to start from places like Vienna, Paris, Madrid, maybe. And then you go into smaller places like Prague and maybe smaller cities like Kent and so on and so forth. But the core of it is actually interestingly enough, regardless of political systems and so on, the core of Europe is structured around series of centers. There are not that many. And they create a culture that has such a power that the rest would have no much option but to respect it and take it as a criterion. Not necessarily to limit it, but to take it as a criteria. Now, you can probably appreciate what I said so far about the Saint Michel. That the Saint Michel 
And that was part of the intelligence. I would say definitely intelligence and smartness of the people around Osman. Osman himself was a very intelligent guy. He was a politician. He became uh, he became uh, what is it, the mayor of, of, of Paris and so on and so forth. But he was a lawyer by education and humanities he studied and so forth and so forth. He was simply very at home in what he was doing. And so he understood, you know, that certain things has to be done in a certain way and with a certain kind of people and can be ignored, so has to be taken on board. And so under Osman, you know, there's a kind of critical understanding or critical concentration on how much you need to organize things, how much needs to provide for the coexistence and possibility of the city just to exist, from transport to food to you name it, and just the basic metabolism of the life. So it doesn't fall apart. And yet, the city only benefits from it, doesn't lose. How do you do that? How do you cut a few boulevards through a city? And you can see the boulevards are not networked. They are very carefully chosen just to do the right, almost like surgical touch. You know, where you cut into the heart or whatever you operate on is extremely important where you start. And you do peace, you don't do the whole thing. The rest, the organism, is taken care of. And, you know, so that kind of thing that we need probably in the future to look at it carefully because this is one of the critical points which has been mostly misunderstood in the 20th century. You know, when you come to Corbusier, Corbusier has walked over that like a bulldozer. And, uh, you know, and despite all his abilities and sensitivity when it comes to smaller things, completely lost. But he's lost completely, mostly, because he unfortunately is hooked and caught, imprisoned, rather, in the dogma of the Renaissance that I mentioned before. City is a big house. As I mentioned, this is still the back out. And you know, you're just completing the, con the, the argument about the Eastern Mission. The cut goes through, in this case, existing part of Paris, we know that. And it goes to the heart almost of what used to be and still preserved as Cartier Latin. So we are really in the middle of old Paris as far as its most sophisticated dimensions are concerned. You know, the universities in the desert, old Sorbonne was, there were students with the colleges are. Well, used to be monasteries before, like Cordelier and then, you know, Francis and Dominican and all this, that grow into the Cartier Latin, which is very complex up there. And we are now looking at it from behind. You can see the, the, the church, the, the Temple of Sorbonne, just on the right, right, right hand side. So that gives you an idea. Now, what is interesting about that, as we remember seeing you know, the new bed and the old one, there doesn't seem to be any kind of provocative conflict between you. There's a kind of a deep continuity. Certain things are kept. You know, the type of buildings, the you know, situatedness of the buildings, even detailing and so on. But most of all, the way of life. And quite frankly, what you see in the, uh, on the horizon of the street is all new. There are all new things. Just the time when the boulevard, the Michel was built, they put up things like uh, little kiosks and, uh, and uh, lamps have been designed especially for the, the lamp is Art Nouveau operation as you can tell. And so, it will, so it's all kind of new. Then all this kind of around stand, stands for newspapers and news advertisements and see. So it goes, so you know, broadly people would call it the street, secondary structure and furniture. I'm using it as a contrast, as a secondary example, which brings the message and the argument slowly home in a very kind of interesting way, as it was from the back door. Totally against your expectations and totally against our expectation, and probably also against our wishes sometimes. You sure, you know, anybody who's in Paris knows this particular part, sequence that starts somewhere, for the purpose of my argument now, somewhere around Louvre, goes to the inner courtyard of Louvre, Carousel territory, continues as Tuileries, that becomes eventually park, Tuileries, 
contaminants in the middle. We will see all, all that in detail, but contaminants in plus concord. And the concord, continuous feather of the axis, as Charles Alizé, comes to Arc de Triomphe at the top, and in the last decade has been extended through, well, after the war, into La Défense, and goes into Nancy and beyond, goes into you know, Nanterre, mm -hmm. University of Paris as well as there, and this new final city, whatever, frame, I love to call it, you know, it's not an arch, it's called arch, but it's an arc, but you know, it's just a big, huge frame, like a theoretical completion of the sequence. Now, what it was asked, this was just, you know, very few things selectively, look at that, and tell me now, when it was built, if you don't know anything about it, you say, there must have been something like Philadelphia, the group of planners, wasn't it? Mm. It's very clever. I mean, it's a piece, a very coherent piece of planning. So it's definitely convincing that it looks like a homogeneous piece coming out of one office or one group of people mm. and so on and so forth. And yet, what we're looking at is probably more than five, six hundred years old. The critical section would be 16, 17, 18, 19, 20th century, and 21st century, well, maybe part of it. So we're talking about from six years, about 400 years of development. Now, that represents probably about 12th generation. The 12th generation didn't know much about each other. So, you know, if there was an architect, if there was a designer, if there was a mayor of the city or body, if there were, you know, the Parlement uh, de Paris, which was a group of, you know, the main office of Paris, the elders of the city, running the city, in you know, metabolism, daily life, but also development and future, they've been part of the generation, they're coming and going, and not, not elected for life, or elected only for a period of life. So, we have this sort of curious sort of sequence, discontinuities of generation. And you know, we don't have to go into details, but the discontinuities represent also real discontinuities but for 50, 60 years, 70 years, nothing at all has been happening there. It was dead. You know, 17th century had this incredible long ongoing fight revolution called La Fronde. You know, Conde against King and you know just didn't agree who wants to be a king or who be. We are in you know, the Protestant Catholic conflict line. Anyway, you would find a series of those interruptions. So on top of that generation discontinuity, there is also a discontinuity in terms of events. Mm -hmm. So the city is practically dead. The Tuileries has never already developed <coughs> into a piece of garden in the city. Nevertheless, it's still uh, seen as uh, something which is cultivated, and yet it was not. You know, the grass was going over and trees were pulling out over to care of it and so forth for many, many decades. Now, of course, 19th century, many of it, one of see that. So, we can ask the same question. Who designed that sequence? Who is responsible for Louvre, Tuileries, and what follows from it? No. We don't know. And yet we do. Part of it we do. Now what I'm going to do, you can follow as sequences. Answering the question, labor, level after level after. Who did design? Who was responsible for it? How it came to existence? But that's more or less what comes out of it as a kind of development that we are familiar with. We have moved from Louvre, as you can tell, plus Concord, which is just underneath our feet. And you go to the beginning of Champs Elysees. You don't have time, and it's not the purpose of the talk today anyway. The argument is different. But it would be very nice to go deeper into it and see how the sequence also plays a role in the city in terms of its transformation from the down to earth every day to the more sublime, to the more transcendental, which eventually comes to the Elysees as Elysees of life, salvation. And so on and so forth. Anyway, we don't going to do that, maybe one day in the future. That's really the old roof. Strangely enough, 
the foundations of it, as you have it, you know, this four turrets and corners, of, the foundation of it has been dis the, the made accessible now. They open it as a basement, so you can go and see it. You can walk around the foundation of Louvre as it was. The building is mostly 15, 15, and 16 dollars. 15th century, probably. You know, we are in the territory and age as the chateau on, 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 on the river down there, in the Seine, on the Seine River. Chambord and Chenonceau and uh, Blois and so on. Right, so it's a kind of fortress in the city. It practically remains so, except that people try to, and not kings, but you know, the most of the civil servants, try to really make it into a centre of the civic life. Because the civic life, as you know, until then, the real civic, so it's, you know, yeah, the centre of the civic life <coughs> was on the island, you'll see there, and there, there is now the police quarters and prison. And there is still uh, one piece left, one piece is preserved, is the La Chapelle, it's very beautiful because it's chapel, it's beautifully preserved, glass windows and so on. There used to be a Royal residence. The chapel was part of it, of course. Offices and you know, the basic life, the official life, the kind of thing that has developed around Westminster, I suppose, was before then. Any anyway. <coughs> the Louvre, when it started developing in the sixteenth century, they started making it directly into a kind of almost habitable thing, almost habitable thing, but mostly filled with galleries and things like that. It was practically built over, it was just like a village. You know, people had you know, the streets and animals in it and all the rest. It was just like an ordinary piece of normal medieval city. The only thing which came out out of it is along the river is a huge long gallery. One of the kings was very worried about uprisings and so on. Tried to make a secret, you know, decent escape from the city out. So he creates a Grand Gallery because just behind here at that point was the wall of the city. So he goes with the gallery across the wall out into the country. And that created the condition for the finalizing of the whole piece, this Palais de Tuileries. And that's where the term comes from. That was built by, I don't know if all these things make any difference to you, but it was Philippe de Lorme, quite a good architect, in the late 16th century, eventually occupied and made known by Marie, Marie, Marie Medici. So the Louvre, what is it now? At this stage, it's developing as a political affair. It has something to do with the life of Paris, but very limited, actually. You know, some of the offices there, but not that many. But gradually, gradually, it needs to be open because of the scale and because of the arrangement, <coughs> open to the life of the rest of Paris, and other ingredients start coming coming into it. And we'll see them in a second. So now we go into, well, that will be probably a picture, somewhere around 1860, 1870, because 1872, the Palais de Marie has been burned down in the period of revolution. And it was so bad, they decided not to restore it, to take it down. So it's gone. So it is from now, from that time on, that it's open to the garden. So the garden begin to be a different affair. Now. The Tuileries beginning to be treated now as public garden, not as part of the Palais, an internal affair, but as an external affair, as something which is part of the city. What you also would see, and that would be interesting for us to comment on, that there is a gradually, gradually, step after step, as this develops in a sequence to what's actually on, it also develops back right down to the point where it ends up at Place Bastille. So from Place Bastille, you can say, there's a kind of link that is still produced by that you know, series of, of interventions from Place Bastille to Place Concord. And that's Paris nowadays, probably most visible in terms of its explicit physiognomy. Now that gives you another kind of idea, very much sort of um, restored for the modern view. 
you know, that's how he would appreciate and see it. As you can tell, of course, if you're looking from the roof, how it's open now, the carousel is a triumphal arch, that's an upper lobby contribution, and it's carousel because this was a place, it was like an extension of the courtyard, the main courtyard, into a very symbolic space for horse ballet. The horse ballet was in that time incredibly important. The French practically dominated in Europe. And it was like a ballet, but the ballet was written down as a ritual. The court was represented there, the king of course, and the ballet was structured as a movement of planets and so on. So it was mythologically, astrologically structured event that has something to do with the metabolism of everyday life also eventually of the city. And I say. So that particular game, the horses on, you know, in dance are called carousel. Napoleon turned it into a triumphal arch. That speaks for itself, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, those changes in, in the nature are quite let us study. So he made an arch so that you can occasionally walk your army and be famous. Okay, next one. What is interesting about that is how the space is structured, and I'm trying to bring it home using series of elements. Because if you go to the garden now, what you have is a sequence that comes from a very explicitly public complex called Louvre. So you know you get it very well. Now you open it to the garden, so you go through something which is still on the ground level horizontally, very kind of explicitly structure, here's the geometries and so on. But then it comes to a square, the city square, then it comes into a boulevard, and the boulevard is structured very much like a kind of processional route, and we are on the champs Elysees, moving to the culminating point at the Etoile. But, you know, the town sits on the top of the hill, and it's Etoile, that's very complicated, that's the way it culminates. And Etoile, as you obviously know what it is, Etoile is heaven. <coughs> now, that's easy, but the scale of it is quite tough. And how they did it is very, very ingenious. The structuring of that space, call it, is done as a open movement of people. Great freedom, you can move through the park in a very different way than you would through gardens. The footpaths are not necessarily the territory is around theaters. Theaters around fountains, around particular enclosures, <coughs> semi enclosures, and so on. Now, what is interesting about that is that you get movement of people, and suddenly you get sculpture. The sculpture actually are not the terrific, but it's not important. The role of the sculpture is not really to be very important individual pieces, genius of you know, product of art. They are just there uh, mostly because of the transformation of the space. The people are now reproduced on a different scale, much higher, but to their scale, on a different scale, on a higher scale. And the tree is the highest piece. So you're going from your own experience to the sculpture, which is already silent, creating the transition, moves you towards the scale of the tree. The tree eventually creates a whole sequence around the edge and establishes boundary, <coughs> and with that are measured against the building which are behind on the really body. So you take a section, you get human beings, sculpture, trees, and the building and its size on the really body. And it varies both ways, so you kind of mutual reciprocity or resonance. And now the advantage of that is, of course, you know, what you have done on the platform is uh, this huge scale, which very often in the big frame environments <coughs> are insufferable. If you come to Versailles and you end up in the beginning of the Great Bazin and you see the horizon, you say, give me a break, I'm not going there. So you leave the you know, retreat. And it's sort of that kind of off-putting place, quite frankly. It's good for horses and whatever means to get there. <laughs> and here you don't have to worry about it. You know, you're just taken there by sequence. Because when you end up on the really body on the buildings, the buildings are a row of houses, arcades underneath, shops, some of the most interesting, you know, interesting 
shops in Paris, chocolates and stuff like that. Uh, and then you go to really body, and this takes you to the Place Concorde, and you end up again in the city bar. So you, you know, repeat it. You're not tired, you're not really fed up, you're not offended, you just keep going through the Tuileries, and eventually you end up in the Concorde and you're in the city again. Okay. So, we may discover a name for that particular layer, how it's structured. And kept, you know, in the back of your mind, keep opening the, and asking the question again and again. Who designed that? Who did that? Who is responsible for that? What I just said now, you will find in fragments of text some people who were responsible for it. For gardens, for trees. For the, the kind of thing I'm saying is not my invention or interpretation. The link between the figure, the human being, and figure, and its role in the garden, and the role of the figure in relation to the trees, and whatever it grows around, and then to the surrounding of the garden, its boundary, and its fabric, eventually, and the fabric of the city that comes close to the entrance of the garden. Those are all things the people who were working there are aware of it. We are in a culture which has to be really appreciated with certain effort for us because they communicate it without making much noise about it. If you take typical space of the period, 18th century, 17th, 18th century, anybody in Europe, almost, from Spain, Italy, Portugal, up to Germany, and Central Europe, France, and what you find is that people were working on different levels. They were working in one building, one pass, or one church, or one monumental building, whatever, one building, and there will be of at least two or three, mostly three different professions. Very different, different training, different education. We're talking about people who will be doing the architectural bit. Then there are people who were doing uh, sculpture and stucco. When it was done, the painters came and did frescoes into it. There will be still people somewhere hidden behind the scene who formulated the program, what should be the, the content of it. You know, what kind of frescoes you're painting on the ceiling. And and they will be working, you know, without any fuss. And also with discontinuity, and yet, in the discontinuity, preserving continuity. But I can now introduce a term that we need. What kind of continuity in discontinuity is there? I would describe as continuity of reference. The people who were, you know, just to put it out of the blue, or you know, started from out of the blue. If you put yourself in a situation like 16th, 17th century, you are in a space which was already there in 16th century, maybe 15, and moves to what 18 and so on. You are on a kind of line, open to the time. And what happens there is that uh, you are not sort of, um, as it were, fixed to some kind of a style or something. You're communicating with what is already there and continuing on it. My definition of creativity is just what I said now in different parents. Creativity means to create something new which hasn't been here before, but in such a way that doesn't destroy but only continues and improves of what has been already here before. If you don't do that, you're not creating, you're just producing. And in production doesn't matter. You know, if you destroy it, replace it, or ignore it altogether. So this is a key of creativity. So this complex sequence can be seen as a beautiful illustration of a deep, profound cultural creativity. This is a combination. This is a combination. That's what really it was in the most concrete sense. The two very used just to go in, promenade, sit down, read whatever, talk to somebody. You know, they kind of normal events that we do in gardens, but it would go further. You know, we place where people perform. Uh, for instance, pantomime would be taking place first in places like that. In later times, late 18th, mostly during the 19th century, the garden would be used very regularly for a huge scale, I mean in terms of a number of people coming, uh, open music, performances and dance. <coughs> you know, if you put it to that sort of level, or we start from that level, we have this most intimate introverted personal experience of a huge space, which in scale is monstrous. And yet, 
You've got other people in the engine or they suffer the same problem. The people does it up, does it up with the sculptures, trees, and then comes the little ocean as well. And all oh, takes it into the secret. Oh, but let it be very large scale. Still presenting maybe something of the music, maybe even the poetry, or those meetings, you know, in the theatres. So the group performances in park and so So that's very complex. Now that would illustrate also what we mean very often when we're talking and people with great ease without saying the second sentence what they mean about urban gardens. What is urban gardens? What is it urban? Well, the degree of sharing and the degree of continuity of reference or continuity of references. So that's where the two very comes in. Now we're coming to the middle and the middle is a bizarre thing. It suddenly becomes square, plus concord is a square. But there's no building inside, there's nothing around. There's just trees, sculptures, stone, a bit of found in the water. And Obel is the tree in the middle. So what is it beginning with? There are a few buildings on the side of the city, but the square itself, as if there is detached from it, it's just sort of interruption of the garden, transformation of the garden, urban garden, into urban space, into civic space, eventually to continue again as something which is elevated to a different level, as a garden of different kinds, that's the Elysee. There's a garden which is as if were anno um, anointed, yes. anointed by the beauties of urban life and goes into further level. So the Elysee would have a criteria what should be, or could be, and could not be there. You can and they did, in 19th century or any late, produce a permanent building for theatres, permanent build, theatre building, concert room is there. And then, I can only touch on it without going into it, the first world exhibitions was there. We're talking about the 1855, trying to come as quickly on the scene as the Brits did, with their big exhibition, Hyde Park and so on. And this is a time, of course, where the avant garde and <coughs> strictly modern Paris and modern culture in Europe actually comes officially on the scene. We're talking about paintings, particularly Courbet, is exhibiting the Napoleon at the entry on the area. We're talking about people like Manet. Manet is this round, that's this painting. Uh, we're talking about uh, literature, music, um, and of course, eventually architecture comes into it. What is left of it, of course, is the yeah, is a very sad two pieces. Grand and Petit Palais. There is a big exhibition occasionally. So we are on the transitional stage. We're giving goodbye to Tuileri and moving into Concord. And the Concord would definitely speak for itself. That's where we have his Concord. It ends up in a canal, kind of transverse piece, a bit of water there, sculpture. But basically, the link between the gardens and the square is just the little bridge. It takes you there. Are you moving around, by the roundabout? Mind you, we have to go through at least two or three modifications of it. So it's not really what it is absolutely now, today, because they had to modify it. You know, the arrangement that was there at the beginning was wonderful, but it was for a very slow traffic, and it was for walking around and all that. You know, that, that, just been, that had been changed, so it's not as it is now, but still. Now, what has been built around, and that's the continuation of the Rivoli, really culminates here, and culminates in two buildings, which are Civic buildings, the ministries, ministries of agriculture, ministries of something. And they open in that sequence here, that way, across the bridge. So, Place Concord, Pont Concord, and then on the other side, building that you're going to see in a minute. So, you can see that in the same space, suddenly, you can, as it were, move in and do your own thing. And we had already seen transformation of like that twice. 
you know, you're going from the city, from the ritual site, you're going from that into the garden, the garden becomes park, the park, because we didn't talk much about details, you know, the difference between gardens that I would make and park, or landscape that actually garden, sometimes it's called, <coughs> is quite fundamental. Uh, the gardens themselves, particularly the Renaissance, they are practically horizontal affairs with parterre. And the parterre are those things that are practically made out of grass. There's a lot of very detailed, very precisely cut flowers. They're not flower beds, they're flowers practically, you know, like goblin. And those things, in the current kind of literature, find you refer to the imitation of trees and paradisiac landscape. And paradisiac landscape is above you. So it's a reflection of what's happening in heaven, what's happening now here. So the paradisiac treatment of the parterre is the key to understand you know, French, not just French, but primarily French, French garden on the parterre level. There's only one segment of the garden, you think. And uh, you know, then it goes into the sky and cuts trees into shapes and stuff like that. Okay. Then, just a little comment about that, it's kind of interesting. If you look at the role of the garden in city, because we look at it horizontally, you see sort of, you know, city is there, and this is the garden, and it, the end of conversation that is communicated somehow. What is completely ignored and forgotten, and I'm, because people you know, don't take it into consideration, is the key to it is not there, the key to it is in what is common to them, and what is common to them is the reference to the same cosmic conditions. In other words, they both, the city refers to it, and we'll see it in a minute, and the city refers to it, and the garden refers to it. The garden is an imitation of the terrestrial, sorry, terrestrial you know, configuration and, 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 and elements. You find it very easy in Renaissance treatises, Serbia, for instance, they sort of very laconic comment. He spends a normal amount of quite a bit of time looking at ceilings in buildings, in villas, you know, what you do. And you remember the Renaissance ceilings are quite elaborate. And you're looking at it and saying, you know, why do you bother? And then he comes to the garden and he says, what we said about the ceilings applies to the garden now. Okay? <laughs> Very good. So, basically the same problem, you know, the celestial, the celestial, and then he uses language, and language is taken from those cities. They refer to that as the Celestial Sofito. <coughs> Sofito Celeste. Um, just as a small comment, you know, the language is so critical, and we have to struggle to get into it. Improvement in cities in Chronicles, for instance, and that was much earlier, but it still preserved up to the 17th century. The level of language and nature, when they speak about improvement, they say, and that street should be widened, paved, and properly drained. And the result should be as far as possible at similitudine paradisi, which means as close to the vision of paradise. So there's still some kind of an ideal vision as a measure, where it comes from, about the origin of legitimacy is, and what it should be like, you know, by approximation. So we are in a sort of curious mouth, you know, that the natural setting, garden, that's the of that, garden, becomes a square, a public square in the city. And as you obviously know, that becomes the heart of the modern history of France. Because, you know, that's where it's obvious now that exactly the place where the guillotine was situated. And, you know, they produce quite a bit of ground for the modern French mentality. Now, so that's what it looks like. And it gives you a lot of interesting things. You know, we, we, we can only touch on things. We can probably return to it sometimes in the future. But you see how the gardens, the Tuileries, you know, is a, a final vision, the eye, which is a spherical, of course, operation. And it's kind of imitating sun, imitating the movement of sun as a circle, a reflection of that. And finally, as a summary, it turns into a similar element, but now it's dry, there's no water, in the center of the square. And the square then opens, of course, the main avenue that goes out of it, you know, the Elysee in the middle, 
and then the rest. What interests us is what's crossing it. They do establish the bridge. So, they produce these two ministries on both sides by architect, quite okay architect, she called Gabriel. He did the piano in Versailles. Okay, yeah, I'm here. And in the middle, in the distance, there's a tiny little opening space, indirect, kind of indifferent depths, deliberately so, and a church, church of St. Madeleine. And the Madeleine has been already designed the way that the uh, Westminster Abbey became. Church as mausoleum, that really is what it is. And it was built by the uh, Napoleon. Napoleon described, you know, it's been named since then, it became known as the Temple de Grande Armée, the Temple of the Great Army. That's what it is. So again, it celebrates, you know, this sort of uh, post revolutionary situation in the French culture. So we're dealing actually, like it or not, I touched on it and didn't name it that way, but we're dealing with great deal of religion here and transformation of it. We're dealing with politics, no question about it, with military affairs. We're dealing with the identity of the city. We're dealing with the problem of architecture and garden or architecture and the, shall we say, conceptual and the more kind of natural levels of the world of culture. So um, that's all happening in that street. That tells you. Now watch the Madeleine and try to remember the facade. Because exactly on the axis of the Madeleine, as you're crossing the river, you come to a facade which has been artificially made, which never been there. It's built in order to create dialogue between the temple and what the revolution produced in terms of freedom and all the rest that should be protected by the army but should be cultivated by the parliament of Paris. So they practically do direct imitation of that. You know, think about it. You know, this is designed as a church, is built as a Jeremy church. The other side was designed as a palais and become eventually parliament, but it wasn't designed as a parliament, it became a parliament. So suddenly you're creating a situation artificially, you can create the culture as you wish almost. The freedom suddenly is very different from tradition. And yet, your intervention becomes somehow built on the foundation of the tradition and as if it was the continuation of it. It creates the illusion that you know, you're not responsible. It's all happening because of the culture, which is already there, it's pushing it. That way. Okay. Now here you have the concrete situation across the river. As you cross the river, you hit the facade of the interesting building. That was there since about very late 17th century, early 18th. It's a typical palais. It's called Palais Bourbon, so it belongs to the royal family. And what they did during the revolution, eventually, they created parliament building out of it. You can see the auditorium and the parliament room. But behind there is a plain, there was a plain wall. Before they made the modification, there was a bit of a garden and wine was growing on that wall, silently. Now they made a facade, a whole piece of building, in order to put it and get it into the axis of the land. and Cessan, Assemblée Nationale. It's a very, relatively speaking, you know, artificial stuff. You're building it from tradition. You do your best to continue as if the tradition is not dead. And yet, you're creating something which is quite new. That has affected the culture as a whole. Here it is, you know, visible in the archi architectural kind of, a um, bit of a caricature of history. But that is in many things, very important and probably very influential because so popular. There was the same one in theater. And in theater, suddenly a new problem arises. We change the nature of theater, it establishes modern theater as modern theater. We do not realize that performances of any kind, theater in particular, and music even more, was never reproduced twice. 
but it's not very strange. If you, you know, if you perform Macbeth, that's about it for the season. You don't do it twice in a week, three times, four, five times, it's unheard of. And music has been always produced for a particular purpose, for a particular event. You know, weddings, deaths, you name it, or somebody appointed. <coughs> music was always done for a particular purpose. So that changes. And when it comes into it, the middle class culture, the theater is not performed just in the aristocratic residences or in you know, restaurants and pubs somewhere for the lower class. It becomes institutional with all. Theater becomes a phenomenon which begins to have its own fabric. There are very few, if you go through Europe, there are very few theaters before 1800. Late 18th century has first time produced, start producing theaters. And you know, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't, then it grows like mushrooms. But um, there are very few theaters. But it becomes a very popular part of culture. The theater becomes probably as overwhelming and powerful as television is for us today. Well, not for me, but for us. <laughs> so um, now the problem begins. There's a problem. Because you are brilliant paint pay, pay, performer. I mean, can some of the actors we know from different sources are just brilliant geniuses. I mean, Moriere was not just a writer. He was 80% an actor, and he wrote. And he was apparently absolutely stunning and good. And so it goes, so it goes. Good actors. But you don't now perform once for a purpose. You perform five times in a sequence. During the season, you perform your Macbeth 50 times. And some of the actors start saying, now, what am I going to do? You know, in one of your play, I'm supposed to die. And during the week, you perform it, ask me to five times. Am I supposed to die five times? <laughs> there are only two options. Either I don't take it seriously as a joke, and I don't feel anything, death or not death, doesn't matter. Or I take it seriously, but then I am myself that. So, the answer was the battle of the books, as well, a continuation of it, modern, new, and so on. And it was called, eventually, a paradox of the actor. French writer and philosopher and you know, literati called Denis Diderot, who no apart from anything else, is also responsible for the main part and for the organization of the French Cyclopedia. He wrote a booklet, which is called The Paradox of an Actor. And it's about mask. So the conclusion was, uh, yes, you are serious, but you build it into a mask, which you can take off and put on, and you don't necessarily believe in it. Therefore, that protects you against exhaustion and death. So the phenomenon of mask suddenly begins to be a dominating dimension of modern culture. And you have it in restoration. People have no problem to imitate gossip. That was unheard of before. You don't do that. So imitation is all together. All the spectrum of phenomena becomes mask. So the culture becomes like a kind of masquerade, mask, and that's really the territory in which we are now. So the city and the culture, because we're saying you know, city is the cultural framework of architecture. The city becomes, to a great extent, a mask for architecture. Protects it against meaning readiness. And what comes out of it, of course, is the phenomenon of boulevard. I mentioned that before we go to the Champs Elysees, because the Champs Elysees is a combination in many different ways of what we have been through. It, as it were, summarizes the piece, pieces that we have been discussing as a serious part of genuine, authentic historical traditions. So the garden is there, the rituals are there. The celebrations there, not of the fabric of the city is still revealing the truth. But now, when it comes to the modern situation, post 1800, shall we say, mostly, and Chance is there, primarily that, you are in the realm of dream, of vision, of illusion, of delusion, and mostly it's a kind of masquerade. So the Chance is there are you know, something they would like to see and have. 
but it's already just the dream. So now, Bulvana. The Bulvars actually come to existence primarily as a footnote uh, when the uh, fortifications of cities are taken down. So the first Bulvars <coughs> are practically the space that was originally taken by the wall of the city. And that happened in the late 17th century already, and the 18th century began to turn it into possibilities. And that's of course the background, also the Bulvar is the background to the Osman vision of Parisian transformation, or transformation of Paris. Um, the uh, vision of the city, I mean, that really comes out of the greatness, arrogance, and self confidence of the French culture in the late 17th century under Louis XIV. He said, we are so dominating and so powerful in Europe, we don't need fortification of cities. Leave it to the poor guy who's going to be eaten by us anyway. So uh, they take the fortification down. And instead, they do a series of fortified cities on the boundaries of France. If you ever go to Paris again, and you haven't seen it yet, these cities were turned into fortresses, and the fortresses were represented as models. And it's in between 200 and 500 scale. Some of them are even in 200 scale. Whole city, huge. And they have been accommodated separately in the museum in Invalid. The Invalid, one of the big, the whole roof space is full of those models. Because they use them in Paris for the, uh, for the officers to learn the city by heart, you know, precisely where they are. So instead of traveling all around the town, they would have the models of the So Paris was practically now transformed into France. France is doing the job of protecting. And therefore the Bouvard are now liberating. And now you can enjoy its goodies. <coughs> now, I'm putting the right one. Yeah. What is actually interesting here, and we have not done much to spend on it, but what happens actually in that transformation that despite the fact that it is a mask, the mask is still fully conscious and aware of what is the mask of and how does it refer to it, which means there is a certain degree, certain degree of communicative reference present. In other words, if you look at the 19th century buildings, you know, that's typical. This is completely new boulevard. This one we're looking at is a boulevard Italien, and we are looking at it from the window of one of the great impressionist, impressionist painters called Pissarro. And Pissarro deliberately rented a flat, turned into studio, which is the corner. So it sort of opens the view into the boulevard Italien. And I was so fascinated by the changes there that during a very short period of 1952 paintings of the Bouvard Italian. Now, what I mean, you know, what was successful about that was that what normal cities would go, say, through 100, 150 years, the French or the Parisian at that point could make it in 15 months or maybe 15 years. So 150 to 15 was the uh, speed of the change. But the speed, because of the background, created still results which are somehow sufficient amount of continuity. Because the order, to put it crudely, the order comes out of the new intervention and the richness of what the order can absorb is already there. It just opens the doors you know, and let it come out. So the shops and everything that you see on the guard would have workshops and things, and sometimes the whole uh, residence content would be transferred to the outside world. So it was already there, we just decided to you know, give it a dimension of opportunity, freedom on the boulevard, the outside. Now those are interesting moments. The French street, and that's really where the modern culture, French culture really is to be situated and characterized. 
is a place where you are, where you are situated. It's your culture. When it comes to visibility, it begins to be part of the sharing. So that's very, very much important part of the identity of Paris. But if you know a little bit about it, and you spend a bit of time, and you go more often to one of the cafe, yeah, floor, the um, you discover that there are people sitting there that you've seen already almost every second day. Because you go to French cafe to see what's going on. You are part of the urbanity and the richness of life. But you are there also to be seen. So it's a sort of mutual game. The mask and the very reciprocity from inside to outside. Performing in order to perform and be seen as performing. So that's very much, you know, the the the, the Parisian scene. Of course, of course, what is still very powerful about it is <coughs> continuity. It's no question you will find it better well. The continuity, continuity of reference. And I would say even deeper, some kind of a special well, in this case, specific communicative movement that takes place between the fabric, the language, the rituals, the events, and the way of life eventually.